tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. Thanks for coming by, friend, on Friday the 13th of all days. You know, if there's one night you're going to get bit by a cotton mouth or feed your toe to a snapping turtle, it's going to be tonight. And you still trudge your ass out here to see me. I'm touched. Yes, Chester, worse things could happen. And if they do, you can forget about pancakes in the morning. You hear? Now, he won't hurt you. Just being a smart ass, as usual. Come on in, friend. Nothing but trouble out here. Hmm. Oh, yes, that's better. And while we're at it, whew, better pace myself. We got a long way to go. Tonight, we welcome back the illustrious Corpse Child, a notable CTFDN contributor. So smoke them if you got them and drink those glasses to the bottom. Because old Drew Blood has a tell to tell. Rigamole old. Howdy, you're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu and sign up today. You'll get instant access to the whole kit and caboodle, including millions of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012. Ready to throw your hat in the ring, authors? Send your stories to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, shit, you'll get the full treatment. Tonight, we join an old army journalist on an expedition to find a mysterious artifact. So, without further delay, I give you, from author Corpse Child, The Obelisk. We live on a placid island of ignorance, in the midst of black seas of infinity. And it was not meant that we should voyage far. H.P. Lovecraft Meyer Danforth was as kind a man as they came. A good father, hard-working husband, and an amazing grandfather. He was my grandfather. Above these, Grandpa Danforth, Papa Dan, I used to call him, was an amazing storyteller. He always loved to tell me stories of his times when he was young, particularly about the times he'd go around looking for a scoop for the papers. He used to work as a columnist for the Weeping Willow Ledger back in the day. He had enlisted for a short time in Vietnam where he wrote for their newsletter as well. Those he obviously was a little more hesitant to talk about. I never really pushed him much about it either, having been told many times by my folks that that was not something you should ever try to push a person to talk about. Sometimes, when I'd get extra lucky, he'd actually tell me about one or two times where he actually got a laugh while stationed in a watchtower in Saigon with his pals in arms. One thing he'd always told me about was his dream to want to travel the world. One of the reasons, of course, he had joined the army. When he came home, I remember Grandma telling me just how much of a different man Papa Dan was. War does things like that to men, she said. She shook her head when she said this, staring off to the right, ironically the same way you might expect a veteran to do coming off the battlefield. Something Papa Dan did do on occasion, usually when something was stressing him. Something I should make clear is that my grandfather was, at least from what he'd tell me, a strict non-combatant. He was a CO, but still wanted to pursue a passion in writing, as well as serve his country. Again, that's what he always told me. God only knows whether or not he actually did take up arms against the VCs, and I'm sure not even God would actually blame him if he did, and couldn't bring himself to share anything like that, even with his family. Like I said, not something you're supposed to really press them about. 
Whether he ever took up arms and spilled enemy blood or not, though, it was clear that something had haunted him from his service days. He never became an alcoholic or anything like that, surprisingly, but Grandma told me of times where his temperament would sometimes make her want to down more glasses of wine than usual. As well as this, she told me of times where she had walked by a room in the house only to find Papa Dan knelt down on the floor, almost in some sort of prayer she described, while whispering in these weird tongues. When she'd say something to him about it, apparently he'd then snap and devolve into a sobbing mess. He'd always shout out these names all crazy-like, she said to me. Names? I asked. You mean perhaps his platoon? Some of them, I guess. He'd shout names of people he'd show me in his army photos, sure. But then there were others he'd shout out. I raised my eyebrows. Others? She nodded and replied, Yeah, ones I'd never heard before. Ones I'm not even sure were even real. What do you mean? I... I don't really know how to describe them, Andy. Other than they sounded similar to some old pagan or voodoo gods or something. She stared off to the right of me for a moment again, narrowing her eyes, losing herself in concentration. Suddenly I heard her begin whispering, Jubilex, Zansis, Melios. Jubilex, Zansis, Melios. What? I asked. She didn't reply. She didn't notice me at all, in fact, or so it seemed. I could hear continued muttering. She was right about them being near impossible to really describe as well. Adrayak, Adrian, Jehovah, Kaios, Ralik, Jehovah, Adrayak, Melios. I remember vividly how much this frightened me. A 17-year-old kid by that time. I would have almost sworn I was watching my grandmother being possessed by a demon. I had to shake her lightly to bring her back to her senses. She was startled a moment before relaxing again. Grandma, what was that? Was that what you were hearing from Papa Dan? With a grave expression, she nodded her head. After that, nothing further was discussed about that or about his time in Vietnam between me and her. Papa Dan hadn't said much about it either after that day. He would still tell other stories, of course, usually just the ones of numerous antics he and his friends would pull on the schoolyard. Those were always amusing, even if he did end up repeating a few of them. But of course, they wouldn't have my interest, my curiosity, the same as the mystery of what had happened to him during his time in the army. You may be thinking that I'd had the good sense God gave a tree stump not to ask him about the weird chanting Grandma told me about. Sadly, you'd be dead wrong. It was a few months after the day that I'd talked to Grandma about it that he and I were sitting around the fire pit, sharing two six-packs of Budweiser while he told his stories. It was something the two of us did just about every weekend ever since I turned 16. Two guys sharing shitty beer around the fire. I guess to my credit, you could just as easily pass this incident off as me down in one too many and clouding my better judgment. Regardless, things got quiet, settling down, with the flames themselves even starting to die down the embers. That was when I asked him, Papa, who is Jubilex Xanthus Melios? He looked at me for a moment, eyebrows raised in confusion. That name, who is it? What? What name? That was when I started to see his body slowly beginning to tremble. It was faint, but still just noticeable enough. I've heard you whisper that name, as well as some of the members of your platoon from back in... I froze there. Papa Dan had the look of someone who'd just been shot. Where did you hear that name? He barked. This caused my heart to jump into my throat. I opened my mouth wanting to speak to either try and change the subject or to come up with an explanation. Nothing would come out though. 
Papa Dan's body was now shaking a lot more violently. I was bracing myself for him to lunge forth from his chair and come at me. He wasn't violent, or at least, again, not that I was aware of, but his shaking, the abrupt shift in tone, and the crazed, almost deranged look he had on his face made me wonder if he might end up breaking that little perfect streak, you know? Fortunately for me, he did no such thing. Instead, he just leaned forward, pushing himself uncomfortably close to my face and whispering, shuddering, Get the hell out of my sight, boy. For a second, I didn't move. I couldn't. At the snap of his fingers toward the house, however, I snapped out of my stupor and quickly got up to leave. Before I got two steps from the fire pit, though, I felt him grab my wrist. Hard. I stopped and turned. He stood up and once again got in my face and whispered, And so help me God, if you ever say those words in my presence again. He trailed off, keeping his face chiseled in horror and perhaps sadness. Terrified out of my mind, I promptly stumbled as fast as I could back into the house. He didn't follow me. He stayed out there all through the night until sunrise. I didn't sleep that night and I don't imagine he did either, though obviously for two different reasons. I was afraid that at any moment he'd come back and want to beat the hell out of me for triggering albeit inadvertently, some sort of horrid memory for him from his war days. I think he was afraid that whatever or whoever I'd said the names of were going to come for him because I'd somehow invoked them or something. That morning, I remember he came in and I wanted to talk to him, try to apologize or bury the hatchet between us. But he didn't seem to see me and instead went straight to his own bedroom. I noticed he still had that deranged sort of sunken look chiseled into his face when he did this. Admittedly, I was scared. Scared that he'd hate me. Scared he'd kick me out. Which would have been bad for me, given that I had nowhere else to go after I was taken out of my mother's house when I was young. But honestly, I was even more frightened at the idea that I'd done something to him that could have pushed him over the edge. That my little stunt from the night may push him to... Well, well, to my relief, it never became that dire. In fact, it seemed more to me that he had actually moved on from it. He never looked at me the way he did that night again, nor was the subject ever brought up again. Of course, that was also the end of our weekend hangouts around the fire. Not like I was in any objection after that night, though. Despite it never being brought up again, though, it never stopped being something that had my head racked at night time. For years after that, I'd lay awake for hours wondering not only who Adriak Jubilex was, but who he was to my grandfather as well. I never again mentioned it to him or grandma or anybody else, but I never forgot, and I never stopped being curious about it. Jumping ahead to about 2009 or 2010, and I was then 24 and on my own. Both grandma and papa Dan had passed away. Grandma was the first to go, with Papa Dan following behind only three months later. I remember it was then that, for the second and last time, I saw that look on Papa Dan's face. The look of horror and sorrow. He was in a bad state of health by that point, to the point where anything but breathing itself was a struggle for him. Coughing and wheezing, I heard him choke out the question, <coughs> Andrew. Do you remember? I knelt down by his bed. Remember what, Grandpa? I asked. <laughs> that, that night around the fire. My own eyes went wide and I nodded. This caught me off guard for two reasons. First, because of the fact that he actually remembered that but secondly because I wasn't sure how he was going to react now that the subject was breached again. I knew he wouldn't be able to fly off the handle like he almost had that night, but I was still very much concerned about the effect it'd have on him now, bedridden with one foot in his grave and the other tap dancing around it. Listen, he wheezed. 
Listen to me. There's... He jerked with a whooping cough before rasping. There's a journal at the old house. When it's... When it's time... His eyes became heavy and his voice became faint. The EKG beeping began to pick up rapidly. I could hear the nurses coming down the hall as I masked the assistance button. Papa Dan continued to fade as I heard him whisper. Read it. It's my... My biggest story. His eyes closed after that, and his breath became relaxed. I tried to shake him a little, but it was no use. He was out cold. The beeping became frantic for a moment, and the last thing I heard before the nurses flooded the room and ushered me out was a single word. Obelisk. I left the hospital after that in a daze. That would, unfortunately, be the last time I ever saw my grandfather. He passed away that following morning, peacefully according to the doctors. The next few days after that, for myself and the family, were a bit hazy. His funeral was that following week and we had him cremated. Following this was when we began going through his will. He left me the house and everything in it having apparently decided long ago that my mother wasn't deserving to take it. I decided I'd sell the house after taking whatever was of any real value to me or the family out of it. That's what led me to the journal I assumed Papa Dan was referring to that day. It was when I was going through his old room, searching through all of his old books, fishing rods, and even a few of his old journaling notes. Scattered underneath these was an old photo of Papa Dan, However, I could tell that it wasn't like the one I mentioned before of him and his platoon in Nam. In fact, I could tell this wasn't even Vietnam where it was taken, nor were these soldiers or military personnel standing in the photo with him. They all wore these black polo shirts with a giant N plastered over a three-point star and khaki shorts. These, I figured, must have been a tourist or journalism crew he had ran with back in the day. The photo was dated 10-13-1964. He had been sent home from the service only a couple of months later, in January of 65. I wondered then who these people could be, and or how he could have met them if they weren't military personnel. The back of the photo read, in bold red letters, Your country might have forgotten you, but I haven't. Someday our story of what happened that day will be told. I then began to rummage through the other papers gathered there. Through the miscellaneous mix of letters to editors and the notes of other columns he had wrote, I found a small dusty red leather bound book. It had a lock on the front with no title. It took me another ten minutes of rummaging, but I managed to find the key and unlock the book. Immediately a bunch of small pieces of paper fell out of the front of it. I ignored them, though, as the first page had those haunting words written on them, bold and red just like the photo in my grandfather's handwriting. Adriac Adue Jubilex Zanctus Melios. Now all but spellbound, I hastily scrambled to collect the other slips of paper off the floor before leaving the old house and taking the book with me back to my apartment. From there... I spent the entire rest of the next week and a half reading the journal. By the time I'd finished even half of the journal, I knew why Papa Dan was so afraid that night, as well as why he wanted me to find this journal. The following is the account of Meyer Danforth and his team in Egypt in what he had referred to as the Obelisk. September 4th, 1964. The weather here has been hot, miserably so. Men here wonder how the Kongs have always done it, managed to move around so well when the heat alone was likely to sear the skin right from your bones. Some wonder if they're even human at all. 
Personally, I could care less. The heat may be bad, but compared to the other burns I've suffered in the field, it's now more a mild nuisance to me than anything else. What's more important was that I was given the opportunity of quite possibly a lifetime. Two days ago, a telegram was mailed to me from an unknown organization, Tri-Nexus, requesting that I attend some sort of a meeting in Plyme tomorrow night. Details were sparse, but I figured that being that the time was promised to be compensated and there were no strings attached, what was the harm? Worst comes to worst, I simply say no to whatever it is and come back here to Saigon. Western Union Telegram To Danforth M., your presence is requested on behalf of the Scientific Community of America to attend the briefing conference. The conference is set for 1100 hours on September 6. There is no obligation to attend, however we promise that the time will be compensated financially should you choose to attend. We hope you will choose to attend. Sincerely, Tri-Nexus Corps. September 6, 1964 I went to the meeting yesterday. Let me say that I was astonished at first. The representatives of this Tri-Nexus Corps explained that they're a budding subsidiary of NASA, one specially designed for cosmic, spectral, and or generally unexplainable phenomena. They claim to be stationed currently somewhere in the Middle East, somewhere in Cairo, I believe. Apparently, the purpose of this meeting was to pitch a proposal to myself and a group of others, archaeologists, I believe, by the looks of them. This made sense to me, given how much the Tri-Nexus representative spiel seemed to hold their attention. I, on the other hand, had very little clue on exactly what the hell was being said. From what I could make of it, he was proposing some sort of exhibition to the old pyramids of Egypt. What they want from there wasn't made clear. I would have asked, however, I was quickly buried beneath all the others in attendance with questions of their own. Ones that the representative was likely far more interested in answering than the purpose of this crusade. I'd have left then and there, had the promise of ten dollars per every hour I spent in that conference not been so tempting. Regardless of this, initially my mind was essentially made up that I'd pass on this. As much a golden opportunity as this appears to be, I just can't shake the feeling that there's just too much I don't know yet, both about the expedition as well as Tri-Nexus itself. Leastway, judging from the way the others seemed to keep better track of what he was talking about than I, it's likely I would be more of a nuisance than any sort of asset. Admittedly though, after thinking about it a bit further, I can't help but wonder if I'm making the wrong judgment call. I would hate to miss being a part of what could possibly be something big. Something that could very well build rapport with top-tier journals in the country. I just don't know. We were told that should we be interested in the venture, we were supposed to report to the airport in California no later than the 17th of November, where we had then board a flight to their headquarters in Cairo. To make that deadline, I'd need to come up with a decision no later than the 10th which would give enough time for me to be flown to the rendezvous spot from Saigon. September 7th, 1964 I talked to one of my friends I made here in the field, Private Reese Elroy. I gave him a brief overview of the briefing conference as I understood it. For two main reasons, I of course couldn't give him much detail. The first being that I was willing to bet money they weren't too keen on the idea of their secrets being shared with those that weren't invited themselves to the conference. The other being the fact that, again, I barely understood any of it myself. I did, however, make it a point to ask him if he'd know any reason they'd want to excavate the ancient pyramids. I figured he may have some sort of clue regarding ancient mysteries never being solved. As it happened, he said offhand he wouldn't know of any such mystery or anomaly. The most educated guess he had was perhaps an investigation into the Great Pyramids of Giza. 
This could have made sense to me except for the fact aside from its mysterious construction and its endurance through time, there was never any anomalous properties to it. Private Reese Elroy. Even still, Reese had made a point that stuck with me. He told me, Who's to say there isn't something else entirely that the world's never seen before? Wouldn't you want to be the one that shares it with the world firsthand? I know if it were me, I'd want to take that bull right by the horns. I must admit, he has a point with this. God himself only knows what sort of unknown phenomenon happens away from the media there, and I could be the first to change that for American eyes and possibly the world as a whole. That would be a dream for me. I've always admittedly wanted to tell a story to the world, one with importance. To leave at least one fantastic legacy behind when it's my time to go. I just wish it weren't equally as difficult to justify going because of this. Something being so fantastic yet entirely false. Or perhaps dangerous. Either way, I'm still undecided. I still have another day to request permission from command to leave Saigon for the airport. I just hope there's enough time to make my decision. September 10th, 1964 It's taken a lot for me to even write in this journal right now. In so little time, so much happened. It was abrupt and none of us were prepared. An ambush in the early hours of this morning. All around us, the grass and the trees all screamed furiously at us while simultaneously bursting forth with a combination of both machine guns and artillery tubes. Reese's tower was one of the ones on fire watch when it happened. The enemy was smart too. They coordinated this little attack in a way that allowed them to take out the watchtowers first using the artillery guns. I remember those were the sounds to wake me up this morning. Following this, I watched men running down the hallway shouting. The commotion raged on outside and I ran out to see to my horror, all but two of the watchtowers completely engulfed in flames. I wanted to see if Reese might have been in one of the two surviving towers, but was quickly rushed off the field into our safe house, where I ended up staying well into sunrise. I and a few other non-combatants were retrieved when the commotion died down. We had managed to run them back, but at incurring a heavy casualty rate, as well as the loss of our watchtowers. I suppose that was their plan all along, weaken our defenses with a small-scale ambush before hitting us with all they had soon after. I found out later that my friend was indeed among one of the watchtowers to fall victim to the artillery shells. Private Reese Elroy is dead. May he find peace in heaven. As for me, it's because of his death and the earlier suspicion of another far deadlier attack from the enemy forces that drove me to accept the decision to join the Tri-Nexus expedition. I still don't know what I expect to find there, what story I'll come away with, be it a fantastic one or not, but it's a story I'd rather tell than the ones I'd find here in the midst of heartbreaking carnage. The last thing I'll say for the time being is this. No matter what story I tell here, this will be my greatest story. My only hope is that the words here may open the eyes of others to something that was before all but unknown to the modern world. Something less dramatic than the horrors of war. September 16th, 1964 We arrived in California earlier this afternoon. Being a day early, there was no flight waiting for me, nor were there any Tri-Nexus representatives to greet me. This led me to having to rent a cheap motel in a shady part of town. I have to admit, it feels so unnatural almost, being back in such a familiar setting. It feels almost like I don't belong here having spent so long in godforsaken jungles that it seems more natural to me than city life, despite having actually grown up in the city for most of my life up until the time I was drafted. I'm not sure then whether or not it's a good thing that I'll not actually be staying long enough to reacclimate. 
I'm not sure I really could if I tried. In any case, I plan to leave tomorrow no later than 8 o'clock in the morning for the airport. I have to say, ever since that night, sleep has been a near impossibility for me. I can't get the sounds of the commotion out of my head. Honestly, that's essentially the only reason I even bothered to write in this damn thing at all today. Sheer insomnia. Perhaps a little bit of excitement about the upcoming expedition is to blame as well. That's a slightly more comforting thought, I suppose. That and the idea that Reese would be proud. That's about all I got now to keep me from going completely off the deep end. Minor excitement and an expectation. I'm taking the bull right by its horns. I witnessed something firsthand, either to fascinate me beyond all belief, or haunt me more than anything else ever could. If that were even possible anymore. September 17th, 1964 it's been at least five hours from the time we boarded the flight to Cairo. Only about half of those that attended the meeting in Saigon actually returned to go through with the expedition, myself included. To say I blame the ones that didn't return would be a lie, but all the same I do pity them. They may never unlock the secrets that according to the Trinexus Corps lie entombed with the pharaohs of old. I'd arrive at the airport around 9.15 this morning, admittedly having a late start leaving the motel. When I arrived, I found that the plane had preceded my arrival, along with the Trinex's representatives, and about 12 other men and women, all young and all the archaeologist types I'd mentioned before. Before boarding, the Trinex's representative, Mr. Ronald Benson, once again thanked us for joining the expedition and shared his goal of finding a long-hidden secret beneath the ancient pyramids of Egypt. He, of course, never attempted to specify exactly what secret he was alluding to or how he and the other Trinex's members came into possession of knowledge about such a thing possibly existing. This brought back a bit of my earlier apprehension about this venture. How is it that we're expected to join into something when nothing of its details are made clear? Ironic, really. Such a question coming from someone who had spent at least two and a half years taking orders from military officials. Orders that had little, if any, sort of conceivable rhyme or reason to anyone but them. Still, this isn't the military. I'm not on the base in Saigon anymore. And if I'm not mistaken, these people weren't even military funded either. I have to admit that makes me wonder still why it was that I specifically was invited to this. I wasn't all that well known, not even in my own journalism circles. I'd never won any prizes nor even nominated for any. They claimed they wanted an American journalist, an American voice to tell of the events that may transpire to the rest of the country. Somehow, though, I just can't help but feel deep down that that alibi is nothing more than that. An alibi meant to silence me from further inquiries. My only questions, then, are exactly what it is they're not wanting me to tell of and or why. On the lighter side of things, though likely due solely to sheer exhaustion from the past few days of restlessness, I actually feel comfortable here on the plane enough to actually want to try and sleep again. Maybe this time I'll imagine myself in a land far away from here, far from any chartered territories. Maybe I'll envision myself upon a long unknown world that had never before been tainted by human discovery. Perhaps, perhaps I'll imagine the very secret of the ancient tombs. September 18th, 1964 It would appear that I spoke too soon about being able to sleep through the night. It's almost two in the morning and I'm unable to stay asleep any longer, though this time it's through no fault of my traumatized subconscious, rather the troubled subconscious of another of the crew members. The young man was Greek thin and tall, having to actually slouch over a bit in his seat to not hit his head on the cargo hold above him. It was around 10 or 11 last night, while myself and the others were trying to sleep, that I first heard him grunting. 
The others didn't seem to take notice of this, but I did. I awoke to see him thrashing about wildly in his seat. I watched him for the better part of ten minutes in which time I also heard him muttering incoherently. Soft as it was, I couldn't make anything of the young man's whispers. Despite this, I was able to discern certain, albeit still strange, syllables in the man's disgruntled speech. Unfortunately, I wasn't listening hard enough to really pick up on any of the syllables themselves to attempt writing them out here. In any event, it wasn't long before the young man settled back into his seat and relaxed. I, on the other hand, knew further rest was out of the question. Once again, forced to cope through this journal through insomnia and anxiety. I will note, however, that the man's mutterings weren't of simple chatter or babble, as is sometimes common with those suffering sleeping disorders, but rather more like those of one suffering a personality disorder. What I mean by this was that not only was the aforementioned speech in a dialect wholly unfamiliar to any language known to me, or likely anyone else for that matter, I could hear the sounds, the phrases, being repeated, vigorously too, as if it were something significant to him on a spiritual level. Of course, I also understand that this may just be a one-time occurrence, that it likely wouldn't happen again and would pose no danger to me, himself, or anyone else. And yet, in spite of even this, I still don't feel safe trying to sleep again. Perhaps I'll have better luck tomorrow. September 19th, 1964 It was a long ride, having gotten absolutely no sleep. I'm having trouble even now. I might as well rename this my Journal of Insomnia. The young man from last night, on the other hand, was almost calm as could be. Almost. He had never been much relaxed ever since the departure from California. I noticed the stoic, almost frightened expression he carried on his face the entire time. I wonder if the two details aren't in one way or another connected. It would, given any other circumstance, be easy to write off the poor bastard's condition as a product of mental disorder. Hell, with the display from last night, I'd have ventured to guess he suffered from an acute schizophrenia, or perhaps even a dissociative identity. Again, under most circumstances, but if I'm not mistaken, each member of this expedition crew had been evaluated some time prior to the flight. I know I was, though likely not quite as extensively as perhaps they were. I was given a simple psych evaluation with questions relating to my personal health and well-being, and perhaps any family history of mental illness. I would guess that the others, being men and women of science, that they'd be more heavily screened. How he managed to slip by with a glaring stigma such as what I believe I saw last night, I'm not at all sure. From what we've all been told by Mr. Benson, the flight is set to land in Cairo in another three days. From there, he says, it'll take a week or two to be able to arrive at the expedition site out in the desert. I wonder if my mind would be any calmer once we land than it is now. September 23, 1964 Quite a bit of time has passed, uneventful. To my relief, I seem to be able to sleep these past few nights with little to no difficulty at all because of this. In only a few more hours, we'll be landing. The only thing of note that's occurred since the last time I wrote was that I saw the disturbed young man from before having locked himself in the cabin restroom yesterday evening. He didn't come out for hours, and when he did, I noticed just how much more shaken he appeared than he had before. What must have occurred in the restroom in that time is anyone's guess, but if I could, I'd bet money that it and the restlessness from the other night are somehow connected. Since then, he's made no other kind of disturbance or had any sort of manic episodes, though. It is clear something troubles him deeply. What it is, I can only imagine. Something has gone very wrong. The Trinexus crew is in a panic. They're trying to keep the peace among the expedition crew, but I doubt any of them are buying the facade that everything is under control. 
I was both right and wrong about the young man. It's true he was disturbed, and it's true that he'd been suffering some sort of mental illness, at least so it would appear. I was wrong, though, to assume that his condition had subsided after the episode yesterday evening. Shortly after writing the earlier entry, I went to use the restroom myself, where I was met with a scene that sent chills down my back. On the mirror was scrawled in large red letters, a phrase that I'd never before heard or seen. Adriok, Aduai, Jubilex. Adriok, Aduai, Jubilex. The words were smeared across the mirror, running down onto the sink. In the sink next to the drain, covered in red, was a small shard of glass from what looked to be a bottle of liquor. Looking down, I found the rest of the bottle smashed to pieces on the floor under the sink. Once the initial shock of the situation wore off, realization quickly forced another wave of terror through me. When I realized that this had to have been the young man's doing, he had been the only one to use the restroom in the time that this had been done. Something I knew from having used the restroom only an hour or so before myself and encountering no such scene. And the bottle which had been smashed was of Greek ouzo. I stared for a moment again at the words themselves. Again, knowledge of what the words are, the dialect, what they mean, and or what significance they had to the young man, are details that are all but lost to me, are details that are all but lost on me. Yet in a morbid, surreal sort of way, I couldn't help but feel as though they were somehow, somehow familiar. It's impossible to explain, even to myself at this moment. There's so much I still don't know, but something about those words resonated with me in a manner that was primal, like I somehow tapped into a dormant instinct when I attempted to sound out the words myself. In another moment, I alerted Benson and two other Trinexus advisors, informing them of the previous incidents involving the young man. Upon investigation, I saw Benson's face bleach white. The others turned away and did their best not to retch. I was told to quietly report back to my seat while they would question the young man. When they attempted to apprehend him, however, they couldn't get him to move. When they tried to escort him from his seat, he fell over limply onto one of the representatives. His eyes were wide and glazed over. I saw them attempt first aid, believing he had perhaps suffered a stroke or a minor heart attack, only to find that he had actually bled out, revealed by the exposure of the vertical slashes that lined his wrists. Unfortunately, this, of all things that had happened before with the young man's ominous behavior, didn't go unnoticed. On seeing the man's severed wrists, one of the expedition crew members, a woman of middle age, cried out in fright alerting the rest in a domino effect. Benson ordered everyone to remain calm, but it was another half an hour before the scene died down, and even then, I could plainly see that it's everything they could do not to erupt into yet another panic. The young man's body has been moved to the storage cabin at the back of the plane. As far as I can tell at this time, we are set to proceed as originally intended, despite being down a man. The plane will be landing in Cairo in two and a half more hours. It's getting to be night time again. The plane is silent, but I don't believe anyone can rest right now. And excitement or ambition no longer has any role in it either. September 26, 1964 The past three days have been confusing in a way. A number of ways, perhaps. When we landed in Cairo, we were met by their diplomats. Their lead, a short stocky man by the name of Rashid Mahala, welcomed us and conferred with Benson while the rest of us unloaded our cargo from the plane. We were told to wait, though, to collect our things until after the young man's body was removed from the cargo hold. During this time, I took it upon myself to ask a few of the others of the expedition crew if they had any clue as to what drove him to do what he did. I found that most of them, however, were none too keen on talking about him or the incident. An understandable feeling. 
The ones that were willing to talk to me were none too knowledgeable themselves. From what I could gather, none of them knew who he was or had ever attempted to speak to him about anything, including the expedition itself. By all accounts, at least, ironically, until his death, the young man was a ghost. I had also asked if the strange words he had scrawled on the restroom mirror were of any significance to them, if perhaps they had known better of what it was and or what it meant than I, but was met by the same skepticism. Once the body had been removed and loaded onto a truck, presumably to be carted back to Greece, we gathered our belongings and loaded onto the convoy that welcomed us for a drive through tour of the city. I will say that it is a common place, despite its stereotypes of being essentially a city-sized slum. We were directed to their nicest hotel to lodge for the night. I share a room with an archaeologist by the name of Lionel Ambrose. In some ways, I can't help but be reminded of Private Elroy. He's a young man and seems excitable and ambitious like Elroy was. Because of this, I've done my best to limit interactions with him, even if so much of what appears to interest him likewise interests me. Tomorrow at 9 sharp, we set off to the burial site in the desert. I don't know how much of what happens will be recorded, but I'll do what I can when I can. I have to. For the story. For Private Elroy. October 1st, 1964. It is only after what I had learned a little prior that I continue to write today. In five days, nothing happened. The brief tour and stay through Cairo was a pleasant enough one. The town itself was relatively quiet compared to what I was used to in the villages and towns back in Vietnam. Trader markets served as the primary focal point of the town's activity. Today would mark the fifth day we'd spent traveling to the side of the pyramids. In this time, I decided to ask Ambrose what he believed the purpose of the expedition to be. He answered that he had little, if only a vague clue as to what the Tri-Nexus purpose was for the expedition. I tried my earlier theory with him that it was perhaps connected to the fabled pyramids of Giza, to which he replied that, though a possibility, was highly unlikely. According to him, unofficially of course, he had heard Slip mention of something they referred to as the obelisk. I asked him if he knew anything of this obelisk beforehand, to which he replied that he hadn't. When I asked what his greatest guess was about it, Ambrose simply replied that he speculated it to be nothing more than a symbol or icon of worship that had gone unnoticed by most scholars or philosophers. A simple enough explanation, but one I can't understand, at least not in its entirety. If it were only a lost fragment of worship, a tapestry of a long-forgotten era, then why was it worth this much effort to seek it? What properties could it possess? What secrets could it really hold that would make it such a feverish prize in the eyes of the Tri-Nexus Corps? October 2nd. 1964. It's late. I want to sleep, but this was too important to go unwritten. I have begun having visions as well. Now, allow me to state for the record here that no, I'm not talking about nightmares. Not necessarily. Rather, simply a feverishly vivid dream of strange people a term I'm obviously using very lightly, gathered in worship around a monument of stone. They all wore these deep red cloaks and shouted to the sky, holding aloft golden images that I couldn't make any details of as a lone figure ascended against the sun above even the pyramids. As a lone figure ascended against the sun above even the pyramids. Through all of this, though, one thing stood out to me. In their mass, I could hear them collectively call out in a strange tongue, dangerously similar to the ones I'd heard on the plane. By this I mean that the phrases themselves were done in a growling tone, garbled and vicious as though I were listening to an animal trying to speak. From this I discerned the damningly familiar phrase, Adrioch, Aduai, Jubilex. 
That's as far as my vision lasted. This occurred only an hour ago. I wanted to sleep, but questions regarding those words, that incantation. I suppose they were, are, and why I'm seeing such visions has plagued me to such that sleep feels more and more out of the question. My question then is just how long until I too succumb to madness, as had the man on the plane. October 3rd, 1964 This morning has been rough for me, utterly. Truthfully, a part of me fears that the vision I spoke of earlier might indeed have been a product of restlessness, affecting my mind. I've asked around to see if anyone perhaps brought any sort of sleeping medications, to which they all replied they hadn't. Such things were prohibited, something I was admittedly unaware of, but at the same time wasn't altogether unexpected of. Perhaps I was right then about how extensive the pre-screening process was for the others. I also took the liberty of asking Ambrose if he had ever heard of the strange growled phrases and perhaps knew their meaning or what dialect it was even in, as well as if it were even human. A bit to my surprise, he claimed he actually had heard of the phrases before, though couldn't say as to the dialect it was or its translation to any familiar language, other than his speculation that some part of the phrase meant rebirth. When he asked me why I was questioning such a thing, after a brief hesitation, I told him of my earlier vision. The look he gave me still perplexes me to a degree. It was a look that dictated that while he may not have known what it was I was speaking of, he wasn't entirely disregarding it either. Though I believe him when he told me otherwise, I still wonder if he, or perhaps another, either from the Trinexus crew themselves or from the expedition crew may have some kind of research on the phrases the people in the vision, or the obelisk itself. If so, it's a matter I hesitate to press too hard upon with them. In any event, I fear that this is something that won't go away until more definitive answers are found. I only hope it doesn't cost me as severely as the poor bastard on the plane. October 6, 1964 Another vision came to me last night. This one was of a tall, imposing pharaoh standing atop the largest pyramid. As subjects gathered at the base of it all knelt in reverence and called out to him. Again, the phrase was uttered, though this time mixed with several other phrases. All of it was in that same growling dialect. Adish, Folak, Ioden, Dengor, Kaios. Ili, Kai, Adrok, Melios. Following this, I heard the Pharaoh himself call out in a voice so thunderlessly deep that I knew it couldn't have been human. Uralka, Adrayok, Ralik, Gaan, Tosh, Yehovak, Adrayok, Melios. For reasons all unclear to me, hearing these words once more triggered something inside of me, something innate, primal, ancestral perhaps even. What was more was when I watched the congregation then turn to one another, before brutalizing one another viciously, using staves, chisels, hammers, and soon even their own nails and teeth. I watched them tear each other to shreds. What suddenly provoked them to such savagery, and what purpose it was meant to serve is something I hesitate to think of. I can only infer that it had something to do with the mysterious pharaoh's speech. I didn't get to see if there were any survivors to the brutality. I was shaken awake by Mr. Benson and two of the other Trinexus representatives. Evidently, this vision had an unconscious effect on my physical body, as I was revealed to have been thrashing about wildly, as well as caused minor injury to one of the other expedition members by allegedly striking them in the face. 
Following this, I was forced to isolate from the other members by switching vehicles in our convoy to one that wasn't as populated with others. Benson informed me that in the next week or so, we should be arriving at the site. Somewhere along the way, however, he will require that I undergo another screening exam. In truth, despite what I said earlier, I'm not sure if I want to pass this second examination or not. Ever since that particular vision, I can't shake away the feeling that this expedition is seeking something that was perhaps lost to time for a distinct reason. October 7th, 1964 We've stopped in another city for the night. I'm told that it should only be another two to three days, God willing, before we reach the site. For the reasons mentioned before, I was isolated to a room of my own at the hotel we stopped at for the night. I believe my second examination is tomorrow. Though I haven't had any further visions or episodes, yet, I can't stop hearing certain parts of the phrases uttered from the last dream repeat in the back of my mind. Adreyok, ka. Adreyok, ka. Over and over both in the collective applause of the congregation of the hooded disciples gathered at the pyramid's base, as well as the thunderous echo of the shadowed pharaoh at its peak. Unable to stand the mystery for long, I found an opportunity to question Ambrose again, if he may know at least what these two phrases meant. His guess was about as scarce as before, though he did speculate that the phrase ka may be in reference to the ancient comedic term ka, referring to one's spirit. To a degree, I suppose this could make sense, though that still leaves the question of exactly whose spirit. At this time, I can only guess that the particular vision I witnessed was some sort of ritualistic Sabbath. The only problem with this conclusion is that I can't tell exactly what civilization it is one whose religious practices apparently involve genocide. While I'm aware certain Middle Eastern cultures of the time practice human sacrifice rituals, somehow I felt that this was something different altogether, something perhaps as a means of judgment, akin to the biblical rapture perhaps. I think I should mention that this matter isn't necessarily one I feel comfortable dwelling on, but rather one I can't force myself to cease thinking of. For now, the last thing I'll say is that this pharaoh, perched atop the pyramid, is no mortal being. Somehow, though whatever means it has at its command, this pharaoh had the capability to bend the minds of men to its will, seemingly effortlessly. October 8, 1964 I was screened again by Mr. Benson and two of the others an hour ago. To put it plainly, I've convinced them of my mental stability, at least for the time being. They asked me again if I had had any history, either personal or familial, with mental illness or sleep abnormalities, both of which I replied that I hadn't. I explained to them that the incident from the convoy was only an isolated incident, one that I was certain was unlikely to happen again. Truthfully, I said this more as a comfort to myself than anything else. God only knows now whether it'll remain true. More and more, though, I get the sickening feeling that what I'd witnessed was only the beginning of a far larger, far more gruesome, and far more haunting puzzle. Regardless, they found this answer more or less satisfactory and cleared me to continue the journey. We've hit the road again now. According to Benson, at our current pace, we may be able to arrive by nightfall tomorrow, so long as we continue moving through the rest of the day and tomorrow. I've debated having the gumption to ask him about the obelisk and what its value was, and yet I've thought better of it. Regardless of the fact that I'd just barely managed to convince him to let me continue with the rest of the expedition crew, I also realize that I'm still not entirely sure that is really what he's after here. What's the use of stirring a hornet's nest without at least a concrete purpose for doing so? That said, that hasn't kept me from wanting to look into this obelisk myself. 
For the time being, I've asked to borrow a few of Ambrose's textbooks of ancient comedic culture. Being that he was the one to suggest it to me in the first place, it stood the reason for me that for now, he'd be my most reliable source to learn more of it. Despite so far finding nothing suggestive of the subject, I figure he had to have learned about the obelisk somewhere, yes? October 9th, 1964 We arrived at the site just before the sun began to set. The site itself is remarkable, I must say, despite not having been in any sort of condition mentally or physically to marvel at it like the others had. I was exhausted, therefore electing to make for the pre-prepared shelters designated to the expedition crew. The others weren't far behind me with this. Due to being cleared through the psych evaluation, I was once again designated to bunk with Ambrose. I also decided against joining the others for chow. I wasn't hungry. Plus, I was by that point far too engrossed in Ambrose's textbook. Still trying to find any mention of the obelisk or of the peoples I saw in the vision. I have yet to find either, however. It's late, and I think exhaustion alone may force my body asleep any second now. If so, my hope is that my mind is able to rest as well. October 10th, 1964. My wish was almost granted. My sleep had been restful for at least a few hours, perhaps the most peaceful hours I had experienced since leaving Saigon. No visions or sounds plagued me. Then, however, I began to hear the shadowed Pharaoh's thunderous voice again. As before, the two words repeated themselves. Padreyaka! Adreyaka! Adreyaka! No scenery or hallucinations accompanied this. No, it was merely the voice, the booming, unknown tongue of the Pharaoh. It was then that I noticed, too, that the repetition of the words occurred at a rhythm. A cadence, almost. They seemed to pause in between each utterance. Adreyaka! 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 The closer I listened, the less it sounded to me as an invocation or incantation, but rather as... as... well, perhaps a heartbeat. A lone palpitation. A fierce yet steady rhythm. It's perhaps the closest thing to hearing the heartbeat of the Earth and of the cosmos itself. It was amazing. It was cerebral. It terrified me. So much power, it seemed, carried by a single rhythm, as conveyed through those two single words. Adrayok Ka. This afternoon was largely spent examining once more at the site itself. The site comprised of three pyramids, two of which were smaller in height, though considerably wider at its bases. These beset the tallest one in the center. This one was estimated by Benson himself to stand at least 50 to perhaps 60 feet tall, jutting to the sky as a spear to penetrate the bounds to heaven. Obviously, I was considerably less enthralled by the sight of this marvel, and more so anxious because of it. The realization of its resemblance to the same pyramid found in my visions... I remember looking up at its peak, half expecting the shadowed Pharaoh himself to be looming over us, declaring his alien sermon in his frightening dialect. It was all I could do to not begin losing myself then in front of the rest of the expedition. Much discussion was made as to exactly what we were supposed to do. This is when I finally broke the question of the expedition's purpose to Benson to which he replied that the purpose laid within the terrifying pyramid. Some ancient artifact, he claimed, which was interred somewhere deep within its recesses, perhaps even entombed with the pharaoh within. What this so-called treasure is, or what its value is to them or to anyone for that matter, he wouldn't say. I didn't push him either, still holding to the delusion that I was overreacting. 
that this pyramid wasn't the same as what I'd seen before and that the hallucinations themselves were just that. Hallucinations. Perhaps spurred by a troubled and stressed mind, such as mine is. As much as I told myself this, I can't help but counter the optimism with the sense that reality is far darker than this. That I'm convincing myself of an illusion of safety. The only sort of comfort I had today was the illusion of Private Elroy's face looking down from heaven and smiling that I'd pursued this journey. The journey of uncovering man's lost secrets. I fear, though, even this will soon lose its appeal to me. October 11th, 1964 I'm writing this now, having been involved in an intensive deliberation session on how to enter the pyramid itself. Benson and the others seek to breach through the pyramid through drilling beneath it. The question has been brought up of if such an action would even be permissible by the Egyptian government, to which Benson assured that we needn't worry about any such repercussions from them. Of this, I am admittedly skeptical. The plan as of now is to have a commercial drilling crew, comprised apparently of underpaid construction workers, begin drilling an underground tunnel by first light tomorrow morning. With luck, Benson claimed, we should have a viable tunnel entrance in only another week's time, at which point we'll be able to enter through and seek out this apparent tapestry, this obelisk. All I can say to this is, I feel sorry, both for the construction crew Benton seeks to swindle into this operation, and to perhaps a lesser degree for the rest of us on the expedition crew, having already, I fear, been swindled by him into something truly frightening. The longer I look at this accursed pyramid, it seems, the louder and the more pronounced I can hear the phrase repeat in my head. The more I hear it, the farther my mind reaches to figure out its significance and meaning. The only question is, who can I ask that would have such an answer? October 13th, 1964 like clockwork, the drilling crew arrived at dawn yesterday morning and commenced drilling. That was how I was woken up, though I had already faced trouble yet again sleeping. The crew itself consisted of about 12 to 15 men, all worn and exhausted Egyptians, who I can tell have essentially broken themselves in two to three different ways for most, if not all, their lives simply to make money to get by in a day-to-day -day basis. I can only imagine and hope that Benson promised them a handsome compensation for this effort. Should this not be the case, however, I may not be entirely surprised. More and more, I've come to hold a certain distrust for Ronald Benson. From even the beginning in the meeting back in Vietnam, he never ceased to hold information from myself and others. Information that he and I would both know was important to share among the rest of us. I may not know what it is and or his purpose for evading questioning of it, but I know that it could likely affect the outcome of this venture. Not only this, but I'm beginning to wonder if he too is experiencing certain visions as to what I've described as well. Yes, I'd almost be willing to bet on it. For one thing, I've begun to notice signs of fatigue on his own face that reminded me much of the young man from the plane. For another, how and why else when so much information on this supposed obelisk seems so sparse, bordering on non-existent, could he even know about it? More than this, there remains the question of exactly what the hell his purpose for finding it is in the first place. As much as I want to press this with him, I know that wouldn't be wise. Even if I thought there'd be a chance he'd give me an honest answer to the question, I fear he'd have me removed from the project, perhaps as a method of silencing me. Thinking about this, though, I can't help but worry again about my purpose exactly for being here. If such things as my silence would be of concern to him, then why did he adamantly insist that I join this expedition in the first place? October 16th, 1964 
Word has it that the drilling crew has breached the halfway point into the tomb beneath the pyramid. Another three days, according to Benson, and we should be able to enter. The man has had these poor souls working day and night. I've come to one conclusion. Liar or not, Ronald Benson is truly a blunt, shrewd, and frankly loathsome man in my eyes. In one of the very seldom occasions I saw any of them given a break period, typically during the day and only four and no longer than two hours, I took it upon myself to ask one of them, a middle-aged Egyptian by the name of Rashad Imal, what he may or may not know about what lays within the tomb. His reaction at first was one I had recognized as fear, anxiety, as though I had asked him the name of an ancient evil. When he finally did speak, he informed me that no man has ever truly known what laid within this particular tomb. According to Amal, this pyramid had been one reputed to be even spoken of only by infidels, fools, and traitors, as he put it. I attempted to push for further explanation, but found myself quickly losing his favor. I remember he told me that the lord of this tomb was a vile, savage wretch that delighted in the spilling of blood in his name. I once more foolishly asked him all for the name of this infamous pharaoh, for which I was again denied an answer, this time resulting in his insistence that our conversation end then and there. The last thing I can remember him all saying to me is, I pray only that your God can protect you from the might of him within. Others long ago were never as fortunate. If any of you had any sense of reason or any sense of the preservation of life itself, you will go back to your little shelter and kneel beside your bed and then pray that the sense comes to you and the rest to leave this accursed place. Dramatic as I found this statement to be, it's one that I cannot write off as sheer paranoia. Perhaps because much of what he told me appears to correlate hauntingly well with what I've told thus far. Already I was sure this was the tower and pyramid from the vision, and now I'm certain that it serves as the resting place of that long-deceased pharaoh. And above all, I now know that the very sand I stand upon is stained by the blood of an entire civilization that enacted a brutal genocide upon themselves simply in the Pharaoh's name. It was yesterday when I spoke to him all. Since then, sleep has been an almost scientific impossibility for me. Though I've experienced no further visions as before as of yet, I still sometimes hear, in the farthest recesses of my mind, the screams of millions as they fall one by one, mutilated, to spill their carnage into the sand beneath them and behind this. In his infamously thunderous voice, the Pharaoh repeats his declaration. Adrayok God. October 17th, 1964. Another vision came to me this afternoon. It was just after I'd eaten lunch that I saw it. This, however, was something different altogether from the ones before. These visions didn't take place within the pyramids. As a matter of fact, they weren't of Earth at all. What world, or rather planetoid, this particular scene took place on, I can't for the life of me say. It was a dingy, gray, lifeless-looking place with bricked monuments that looked to blend Renaissance-style structures with that of a more Arab-esque tone. It reminded me a bit of the buildings told in the fabled Arabian Nights, large, imposing structures that curve outward toward their peaks. At their peaks were raised long, needle-like spires that attempted to stab at the vast outer dark itself. I wondered at first who could have built such magnificent structures, structures that would have made even the most talented of artists, architects, and visionaries sick with envy. Then gathered at what I inferred to be either a village square or perhaps the center of a planetoid itself were strange beings that, at the same time, immediately filled me to the brim with fright and disgust. Long, albino, writhing figures they were each of them impossibly slender. 
clad in long robes as depressingly lifeless in color as the actual terrain they stood on. I saw how they appeared to gather at predestined points around the large hole at the center. Eight of them stood around the ninth, which stood next to the devouring pit in the center. Something of note with this, ironically enough I suppose, despite the fact I have remarked how depressing the terrain is, I saw that there were three suns that would orbit this world. Each of them were a varying color and cast a different aura over the land. It was when the second sun, the violet one, had reached its peak height that I watched the figures gather around the crater raise their arms. I hesitate to call them arms, though, as they were more like tendrils. Like the rest of their oblong-shaped bodies, their arms swayed and writhed in the air. I caught a brief closer glimpse of one of the being's appendages where I was horrified to see that on each of them, of which each being had at least five, they all bore a long, elongated mouth. While the other eight stood with their appendages raised, the one in the center next to the hole began slithering out of its robe. Then from everywhere, I heard what I can only describe to be the most ear-splitting, most gut-wrenching, and single most painful collection of high-pitched shrieks ever conceived as the being in the center then cast himself into the hole. It was after this that I came back to reality, albeit dazed and scarred horribly. It was so nerve-wracking for me that I was forced to immediately vomit in the sand where I stood. Fortunately, I was alone so no one would ask any questions. Unfortunately, however, I became very light-headed and my head pounds miserably, even now. What is worse is that as I write this now, laying ill in my bed, I still can't stop hearing their shrieks ringing in the far corners of my ears. October 19th, 1964 My headache has only minimally subsided since yesterday. At least the sound no longer sounds in my ears. The headache alone was enough to cause me to lose the entire night's sleep. Like that has been anything new though. The insomnia is beginning to worry me majorly. Though I'm becoming more and more certain that what I'm seeing is more than just a dream, there's still a part of me, a reasonable sense within me, that still holds doubts. It could stand to reason that the lack of sleep is affecting me more and more each day. However, at the same time, how can I be sure it really is merely the product of insomnia? How can I be certain that it's an effect of restlessness and not the cause itself? After all, had not the man on the plane seen similar, if not the same hallucinations I've been? And aside from this, if these visions were only phantasm, then what caused the mall such fright to even speak of or be in the presence of this pyramid? All of this has led me each time back to one central question. What is this obelisk? And what is its purpose to Benson? Speaking of Benson, I must note how much more noticeable the signs of fatigue are on his face as of late. How irritable he's become as well. I saw just yesterday how, for simply asking for a brief intermission from the day's drilling, having been working for 12 straight hours on that day alone, mind you, he all but ripped the poor bastard's head off, claiming that he was daring to impede the excavation when we were so close to success. Whether suffering from hallucinations or suffering from swelled pride, I'm certain no good can come from any further unnecessary contact with him. I intend to avoid him as much as possible, being perfectly honest. The last word from him to the rest of us expedition crew is that we'll have breached entry into the tomb by noon tomorrow. Then we may all see what was lost to time, the horrible secret that we had broken natural law to pursue, and God himself can only tell what price may be paid for doing so. Something has happened again. Rashad Imal was found murdered only minutes ago. The entire company is in an uproar. There were no sounds or signals of any trouble before, plus I remembered seeing Imal perfectly alive and well only an hour or so before he was found. What could have happened? Who could have done it and why? 
All of these are questions that are currently being passed around the camp, none of which anyone has a real viable explanation for. I, however, have a different question of my own, one that strangely seems to have passed right over the heads of the others. Where is Ronald Benson? He wasn't there when Emal's body was discovered, nor has he been seen since. The others, likely due to the shock of the situation itself, haven't seemed to notice this. The thing that bothers me most about his absence, though, is the fact that the last time I saw Emal working on the tunnel, he was there, eyeing him with a noticeable anxiety. It was a crazed, almost rabid look in his eye as though he thought that the tunnel's progress was his life dependency. I say all of this to say that my primary question has only one feasible conclusion, one that I only pray isn't true. Ronald Benson has graduated from a shrewd and lying scoundrel to a full-fledged murderer. I have not shared this conclusion with anyone else as of yet. For starters, there's no way yet to prove that, and secondly, if it was him, it's highly likely his associates may make an attempt on my life to silence me, should they be in on his scheme. As that stands, I already don't feel safe any longer setting foot outside the quarters. As well as this, I've resolved to make sure that my Bowie knife from back in Saigon is within quick reach. I will say this to their credit. The other Trinexus staff appear to be equally shocked at the discovery of Imal as any of the rest of us. I wonder then if they actually know that Benson is missing as well. If not, then I can only wonder what's going through his mind that's made him go rogue like this. In any event, I am thoroughly afraid now. October 20th, 1964 All through the night, all of us of the expedition crew were ordered to remain inside the quarters, while the digging crew was ordered to remain for questioning. For over an hour, this lockdown was in effect. Afterwards, word was released that the expedition crew was to report outside for an announcement. When we all came out, two of Benson's advisors announced that each of us would undergo questioning, both to the possible events of Imal's murder as well as the whereabouts of Benson himself. We were all then isolated by different Trinexus advisors and interrogated. I told them the truth as I understood it, that I had seen them all working only a short time before he was found and that Benson was supervising him at the time. Obviously, I kept my superstitions to myself. It wasn't long, maybe only three or four minutes before I was cleared of suspicion. Others took even less time. Once this was finished, it was declared by one of the advisors that in spite of the panic last night, which had halted the progress of the dig, the tunnel had mysteriously been finished and breached into the catacombs within. Immediately, the dots connected in my head. Benson, having lost himself to whatever ambition that drove him to seek this treasure, this obelisk, murdered Imal in cold blood before completing the dig himself. Realizing this, I spoke up. Noting that I had told them about seeing Benson at the dig site earlier, I told them that it was likely that Benson was now inside the tomb himself. This was met initially with skepticism from the other members of the expedition crew, but I could see validity from the advisors. For a moment, everything was silent as the three advisors quietly discussed among themselves. In this moment, I remember looking up to the pyramid again, again picturing the pharaoh lording from its peak and the carcasses littering the ground around. Faintly, even now, I heard their screams echoing again, buried under his declaration. Adrayaka! At this time, no official direction has been given yet. The advisors dismissed the rest of us once again before meeting to conference among themselves. This was all two hours ago. It's nearly eight o'clock in the evening and they've still delivered no news. I suspect that plans for a search and rescue attempt for Benson are being made. What method or personnel they'd utilize for any such thing out here, far removed from society, and with no present personnel trained for that is beyond me. 
October 21st, 1964. We've been awakened and it's still early. The sun has only just begun to peak above the horizon. The advisor informed us to be ready in an hour. He wouldn't share as to why. I've gotten dressed and am ready to go or do whatever it is they apparently have planned for us. However, I feel that this time should be spent right in here of the vision I experienced late last night. This time I saw again the pyramid, with the crowd gathered at its base as before. This time, however, the crowd was different. Instead of the disciples and villagers that gathered before, there were an all-new crowd of monks or druids, each of them clad in deep red cloaks that concealed their features entirely. They stood for a moment amid the mess of gore that had once been the congregation from before. All was quiet for a prolonged moment until I watched one of the monks overturn a few of the bodies to find, horrifyingly, that a small child had survived the massacre. The child, having evidently gone feral, was found gnawing on the shredded meat of one of the bodies. His eyes were pitch black, excreting some sort of ichor and growling like a wild dog. I saw the child look up to see the monk above him, dropping his present morsel and attempt to lunge for the monk, only to be caught and seized by the latter before being carried off. With the child held firm, I watched the monks depart from the pyramid with the child screeching and howling madly. This time I did not hear the voice of that horrible pharaoh, but instead the heartbeat I spoke of before. A steady omnipotent rhythm, beating forever and ever to the end of days. When the monks departed from the pyramid, the heartbeat quickened its pulse and I watched the sky begin to wash with a scarlet overcast. The ground started to rumble and I could see the landscape start to change, transforming into... into... It sickens me to recall, but I saw the terrain transform into an undulating mass of flesh. Everything, everywhere all across the horizon was all comprised now of living sinew. Pink, slimy, and repulsive, the flesh soil reverberated seemingly in accordance with the omnipotent heartbeat. I then heard the voice again, the alien tongue of the pharaoh, declare, Adish, Alok, Auden, Adekon, Auden, Adreok, Adreok Melios. Beneath this, in hushed whispers from an unclear source, I heard these words. What had begun with blood and flesh, so too shall it end, and be reborn in the image of flesh. Following this, I heard the collective wailing of the slain once more, and the repetition of the phrase. Adreyaka. While the flesh soil reformed itself into the familiar desert terrain, I was shaken awake from my trance once again by Ambrose, who had evidently found me in a trance-like state and believed I had suffered a seizure. Since then, I've been doing my best to avoid both physical and visual contact with the pyramid itself. I don't know how much longer, though, I can continue with this expedition. I fear now more than ever that I've been glimpsing things, secrets or omens, that I was never meant to and may well cost me dearly. Dear God, they're actually doing it. They're going to have us, all of us, enter the pyramid. The advisor stated that we will have to act as a search and rescue party for Benson as they're unable to scrounge together a rescue team that it make to the site in a timely manner. They further stated that this was part of the contracted clause that should an emergency arise, advisory procedures should go into effect, including but not limited to aiding in any rescue attempts for wounded or missing personnel. This was something I had never given much thought to when I signed, though I likewise had no clue of how severe the situation would ever get. Who could have been, really? Who would have thought signing up for an expedition such as this, 
that the circumstances would ever become so bizarre. Well, I know I didn't, and I can see by their equally anxious faces that none of the others had either. In any sense, expectant or not, prepared or not, we've been told that in an hour and a half, we'll be entering that blasted tomb in search for Benson. It would be a welcome miracle to find that Benson wasn't in the tomb after all, and that it wasn't he who murdered him all. Callous as it may be to say, though, a part of me honestly hopes he has met his fate within that tomb, whatever that may be. Date unknown. It feels like I've walked for centuries now. This place, this tomb, it's amazing. It's terrifying. It's haunting. It's... it's fantastic. Immediately upon entering, I and the rest of the crew were greeted to a branching network of tunnels that split off into at least four different directions. From there, it was decided that we'd split off into groups of five to enter each of the tunnels. Each group was paired with at least one of the Trinexus advisors, both for supervision and as a source of light, given that everything past the first foot or so was all but invisible. The passages themselves were long, narrow corridors so tight and condensed that each group was forced to enter them single file. The advisors, of course, took the lead while the rest of us followed behind. As each person entered their respective passageway, I watched the darkness greedily swallow them whole. Finally, it was my turn, and I remember standing for a brief moment, frozen in terror. I didn't want to go in there, into that fathomless darkness, wherein laid one or both of two things, both of which I was certain were pure evil. A long dead yet perhaps still omniscient and powerful pharaoh, or a deranged maniac whose ambition has already driven him to murder once. What if he was expecting this? What if his plan was for the Trinexus advisors to lure us all in and split us apart to pick us all off one by one in the cover of darkness? This also introduced another, possibly more haunting query. What if this wasn't Benson's will at all? What if his actions, especially the murder of Rashad Amal, were not his own doing, but the influence of another through him? These were the questions that made my legs feel as though the bones within them had been replaced with rubber as I took a shaky step forward and entered the dark tunnel ahead with the others. For about five to ten minutes following this, all I could see in every direction I turned was complete, absolute blackness. The advisor had brought and was using a flashlight, but despite it being an industrial lantern, the illumination it provided was comparable to a firefly trying to illuminate the inside of a small cave in the mountains. Even holding my hands only two inches or less from my face, I still couldn't distinguish any features or outlines of them. I don't know how long it was when we finally did find the source of light from straight ahead. It was a mere speck, a dot, barely piercing the blackness beyond. My group continued into the darkness until we came out into the light to find that it led to another branching path. One was a sort of stone winding stair that ascended to a point unknown while the latter was a sort of inclined plane that simply went straight down to a shadowy depth. We were forced to split up yet again here. The advisor and one other chose to take the ascendant staircase, while I and the other two, one of which I should mention as Ambrose, took the descendant path. It was here that something else threw us all into a state of frenzy. No sooner than the two taking the winding stair had begun their ascent, I began to hear the heartbeat yet again, accompanied by the phrase, Adreyak Ka being repeated. Right as the rest of us would have began entry into the descendant path, our attention became fixed on the stairs when we heard the sounds of one of the men's screams coming down from the darkness at the top. Before we could investigate, however, the stone floor beneath us began to shift. Each stone moved all on its own, it seemed, immediately throwing the three of us off our balance. 
When we tried to pick ourselves up again, we watched a large slab of stone lower, sealing off the widened stair, not allowing for entry or exit. The other two were trapped. The three of us struggled for a moment in vain after picking ourselves up to attempt lifting the sealed door. When we realized this was a futile attempt, we stepped away, where the other man with me and Ambrose, a young graduate student from Harvard by the name of Travis Buckner, huddled into a ball on the floor, trembling violently and muttering incoherently. Seeing this, I was briefly reminded of some of the younger privates back in Saigon who were scared out of their minds like young Travis was here. Ambrose, having only given up trying to lift the door, was trying furiously to batter the stone with his shoulder, as if that would somehow work any better. I was the only one that remained composed, something perhaps due from my being used to frightening situations, ones far more exhilarating than this. I ordered for Ambrose to cease his attempt and for Buckner to get to his feet and both to follow me into the descending corridor. They were perhaps naturally hesitant and slow at first to follow, but only after walking about a foot or two past the corridor's entrance, I heard the other's footsteps following behind me. Following this, walking deeper and deeper into the corridor, I heard the shifting of the stones once more. When we looked back, we found that the stone was lowering over our own path, eventually sealing the three of us once more in complete darkness. This almost caused young Bruckner to panic again, until I calmed he and Ambrose down and ordered that we continue forward. We did, and had made it another four or five feet, at least that's what I'm guessing, before stopping again when Ambrose called out to me, noting that Buckner was gone. I turned back. Without a light, I couldn't see either of the two. I called out Buckner's name and got no reply. Ambrose told me he'd been right beside him the whole time until only seconds ago. The two of us began scrambling to try and find Buckner in the dark when a low, droning hum sounded from the other end of the corridor. Looking back, I saw the faint orange glow of torches. Where they had come from and why they had only now appeared, I do not know. I tried calling out again for Buckner. He didn't respond, though instead... I began to hear the chanting again. This time, though, I was able to tell, both from the way the chorus echoed from the walls around us, as well as Ambrose's own shocked reaction to it, that this wasn't another hallucination. Someone was down there, doing God only knew what, and God only knew what it meant for poor young Buckner. With this in mind, I told Ambrose to follow me, and the two of us made for the other end of the hall, where the chanting was coming from. Reaching the other end, however, we found neither Buckner nor anyone else, but instead a large domed chamber that looked impossibly large and spacious given its outside encasement with hieroglyphical carvings covering every inch from top to bottom. In the center of the room was the spectacle itself, a large stone obelisk likewise covered in pictorial carvings. In spite of my anxiety, I couldn't help but take a moment to examine the room, to marvel at just how impossibly large it is. This room alone, I felt, could have easily housed an entire congregation of peoples with room still to spare. The sheer fact alone that every square inch of stone making up the room was covered in hieroglyphs amazed me to nearly no end. Imagine the willpower, the determination. No. The sheer devotion those architects must have had all those years ago when they built this room. The obelisk itself was a crown jewel in of itself, standing easily 15 to 20 feet tall, long and narrow, jutting from the ground as a spear attempting to breach the ceiling. How it hadn't already is a trivial question that persists even as I write this now. Before I knew it, Ambrose was charging headfirst to call out for Buckner. I went after him and immediately upon setting foot inside the chamber, before I had any time to react, the doorway shifted and was sealed once again. Ambrose and I were trapped now in that room, trapped with the obelisk. As I write, 
Ambrose is frantically picking at every corner and every crevice of the room to find a switch or some sort of escape door. I simply sit and wait and write. Somehow I feel now that there was a reason Ambrose and I found this room, whereas the others, even that bastard Benson, hadn't. What purpose and to what end? Well, only time may tell now. Date Unknown The passage of time has become increasingly meaningless. Time was only a relative factor before, but here, in this impossible room, hours pass by in what feels like an eternity as well as an instant. I say this to say that it is impossible for me to tell just how long Ambrose and I have been in this room. I know that it's been long enough for the two of us to start suffering of hunger pain. However long though, it's still not been enough time to discover and read every pictorial carving within the walls. At one point, I noticed that from the upper edge of the obelisk's peak, a large portion appeared to be missing. What should be there I cannot say, for as long as I've spent studying these runes, I cannot deduce any sort of real meaning from them. Even should I have known their translation though, I never had been able to see the carvings inscribed that far up on the obelisk. The ones I've been able to see, however, are stranger than any hieroglyphs or cave drawings I'd ever seen before. Many of them, particularly inscribed upon the obelisk itself, depicted a strange sort of symbol, one with a circular ring that diverted downward and formed four long points perhaps a sort of humanoid figure, surrounded by an aura, lording over more traditional looking stick figures that wielded what I can only assume to be a weapon of some sort. Admittedly, these I've relatively inferred to be depictions of the genocidal visions from earlier. The symbol, though humanoid in nature, differs from the stick figures, must obviously represent that horrible pharaoh, or that's what I had first thought. Then I examined further up the shaft of the obelisk to find that this same symbol was depicted in what I inferred to be outer space. In these scenes, I found that the being was shown to be escorted by a handful of these strange star-shaped glyphs. Looking around the room, I found there were indeed more scenes depicting these beings. In other scenes with the humanoid glyph, I watched it command the skies while men below slew each other senselessly. A few of the glyphs I noticed had the outline of a robe, clearly reminiscent of the robed figures I saw in the vision, carrying away the feral child. These figures I saw were drawn in the act of using various methods of bondage and torture upon unfortunate captives, of which one scene depicts a single one to survive the ordeal, to be then taken into their fold. It is within these carvings in particular that I found the carving of a large castle or tower, one which reflects more of a crude medieval fortress than anything, buried beneath a large mountain of sorts. What mountain it could possibly be, if even a real place here on this earth, I cannot even begin to infer. Nor can I infer as to why such a thing has gone unnoticed for all this time. Stranger still, though, were the scenes in which the stick figures were shown half-risen from the ground, as if they themselves were sprouting from the ground the way a plant would. In these, the ground itself appeared as wavy and malleable in a way, gelatinous almost. A sense of familiarity came to me with this. The way in which the ground appeared to ripple like water reminded me of the way in which I watched the soil around all across the earth transform from sand to live in sinew. Could this then be that very same depiction? Could this crude carving be telling of that vision? That the earth itself was composed of living flesh? That we as humans are merely the products of this ecological anomaly? This very thought has given me vertigo ever since it entered my head. As I write, Ambrose is sleeping, though I suspect his rest is anything but peaceful. I can hear him moaning incoherently in his sleep. Faintly, I can hear him muttering something as well, though I can't tell exactly what. I have a horrible feeling it's something to do with this room, though. 
something with this place as a whole. Be this the case or not, I pray now only for the exit to be revealed so we can get out of this horrid place. At this point, I'm almost willing to say to hell with any of the rest of the expedition. Let them rot in here for as much as I could care. I just have to get out. Date unknown. Out of sheer exhaustion of my own, I'd fallen asleep as well. When I did, the first thing to accost me was that dreadful chanting again. The slow chorus that slowly built in pitch more and more. Adreyak Aduai Jubilex Adreyak Aduai Jubilex Adreyak Aduai Jubilex Behind these I could also hear sounds of growling. Slowly, the vision began to form. It was the Earth. I was seeing the Earth from space. No. It wasn't merely a vision of the earth, it was of its birth. I saw the earth being formed, molded as putty into its familiar shape. As this happened, I saw the earth and its mass wiggle and writhe to form the ocean and the continents. Once this was completed, I was blinded by a supernatural light. So bright it was that looking directly into it threatened to strip me permanently of my abilities of sight. I could actually feel the light searing the flesh from my bones. From the light, I could hear these words uttered in a voice that was somehow far more commanding, far more terrifying than even the Pharaoh's was before. From my image, this world was born for millennia and more. This image has made the world thrive for millennia. Flesh has been corrupted because of you. What is it talking about? I wondered, while the light continued to burn brighter and brighter. I wondered too, exactly who, or rather what was speaking as I was certain this was not the voice of any person. Suddenly, something inside myself came out. It was almost like a dormant instinct. One that I couldn't possibly describe other than to say that it wasn't myself that spoke, but rather something else through me. Whatever it was, being or instinct, it spoke in a raspy, snake-like voice. I'll have come to make it all in. When I spoke... I was seemingly brought out of my body. My senses and the actions of my body weren't my own. The only faculties I still possessed control of were those of my thoughts. For this, my energy was spent trying to rack my mind around what it even was that I was witnessing. Why? And who it was that spoke to me and what his words meant. I was a fish in a bowl. A bird in a cage. Forced to stay in confinement while forces far beyond my comprehension seemed to do with me as they damn well pleased. From my mouth, the snake-like voice spoke again. You have lied to yourself. We all have lied to ourselves. There is no peace, no prosperity. This star will have us all. To this, the thundering voice bellowed, You're the only one that draws it to us. You are why our people were damned. You. I am the one that's saving us all. Through rebirth, I cleanse this world of corruption like you. Rebirth. 
I heard the other hiss condescendingly. Rebirth will not save you. I saw the truth when I was known. From this, I watched the aura of light dissipate to reveal the vomitile looking being within. Tall, slender, and grotesque it was, without sexual organs, without skin, and most horrifyingly, without a face. All across its body, the being had no flesh to cover a single inch of the at least seven to eight feet of muscle tissue and sinew that made up its form. Its head, however, was a completely different story altogether with it being made entirely out of scraps of flesh that constantly writhed and pulsed in a rhythm similar to a heartbeat. I had absolutely no control over my body, else I likely would have screamed and run faster than I ever had in my life. The naked being stretched its gangly naked arm out towards me. My body retracted away, though not of my own command. From my mouth, the snake voice hissed, you cannot be rid of me. The time comes for all things to end. Flesh will live on, roared the being. This time I could swear there was an air of desperation in its words, a sense perhaps of fear. No. Flesh must end, just as the rest. Following these words, a shadow formed behind the horrid being. Gargantuan and wiggling, the shadowed mass appeared behind the figure, revealing a large violet glowing maw in its center that blinded me worse than the horrific being's aura had before. The being's misshapen head pulsed more and more vigorously at this. The star will come, just as it did long ago. I can feel it. It heard my call. The shadow drew closer and closer to the being. The glow from its center burned brighter, hotter, the closer it came. I watched then as everything around it was drawn into it, sucked in and devoured, ceasing to exist. The being's head pounded viciously now, to a degree that I was sure it would explode. You know it's true. The voice hissed again. It was then that I sensed an air of satisfaction in the tone, a sense of triumph in the revelation, as if it were proud to be telling this being that the earth was facing imminent doom at the whim of whatever this monstrosity was. This star, as he kept referring to it as, you feel it too. I can see your fear. I have no fear, roared the being defiantly. The world will live through rebirth, through my image, the image of flesh. All will thrive through rebirth. No. Everything must end. Flesh, life, reality, it all must end. Rebirth is only a lie. At this, the colossal shadow proceeded to devour the earth and everything around it. In an instant, I watched the entirety of the cosmos be consumed greedily whole, never to be seen again. 
The star will have us all. And there's no saving you. The voice ended this with a devious, raspy sort of chuckle before everything faded completely. That was when I awoke again, sweating and panting profusely. For a good 10 to 15 minutes, I sat throwing my head wildly around the room. Once I was sure that I was both alive and fully conscious, both of body and mind, I looked up once more at the obelisk. A further way up, closer to the peak, I spotted a new icon, one that took the shape of an eight-sided sort of star with a large dot or hole directly in its center. In some of these, I saw shapes depicted as descending from it. The other five-sided star shapes I saw before with the humanoid icon. In other carvings, particularly the ones closest to the peak of the obelisk, I saw scenes evidently depicting this eight-sided shape to travel the stars. Everywhere it went, I saw that everything appeared to be swallowed whole. Just as I'd seen in my dream, if it were merely a dream, I'm honestly not sure anymore. Seeing this, I cannot help but wonder not only who or what that was that spoke through me as a conduit, not only who or what the grotesque being was I saw before, but above all else, what was this gargantuan terror that had these beings terrified to death? Questions like these are the sort that would make any man, even some of the most hardened of soldiers back in Vietnam, shake in bed at night trying to wrap their heads around it. They were the sort that would make even the most educated professors realize just how little they know of life itself, how little they could ever know of life itself, and because of this, men as such would lose their minds completely. So much that is being shown to me, so much that was formerly unknown, now being pushed into the light, and yet to still be left with so little, to no answers at all. Yet this is madness itself, and I fear I will be no exception to its crippling hold. November 18th, 1964 I stand corrected in my last statement, grievously so. Madness, after what's happened, would have been a welcome boon. It started when I was awakened once again, having apparently fallen asleep, or at least somehow lost consciousness of myself, to find a searing pain shooting through my arm. My eyes snapped open to find Ambrose gnawing viciously on my right arm. I could hear him growling the way a dog would when gorging itself. When I tried to throw him away from me, he sent a clawed swipe across my left eye, drawing blood across the brow. I tried calling out to him to bring him back to his senses, but it was of no use. Whatever spell he was under, it was no mere madness or psychosis. Somehow I knew this wasn't just a desperate attempt at quelling his hunger after being trapped in this room for so long. His eyes were black, soulless and oozing black ichor, and I could see areas of his skin that he had evidently picked from his own body. Staring back at me, I heard him utter that haunting growl. Hadraeoc, Aduai, Jubilex Zantes Malios. It almost seemed to force itself out of his throat, as though he were being forced to say it. Paralyzed with shock, I was caught off guard yet again when Ambrose seized me tightly around my throat, and with strength that shouldn't have been possible for someone as small as him, hurled me like a baseball straight into the obelisk. Before I could do so much as catch my breath, Ambrose lunged for me, pinning me against the obelisk before attempting to gnash at my face. The black ooze was gushing more and more from his eyes, seeming I noticed to cause him pain. It was everything I could do to keep his ravenous jaws from tearing away my face like paper. 
He was relentless, managing to still tear a sizable chunk from my left cheek. I managed to hurl him away, sure enough, but that ended up costing me the last of my strength, being too weary from pain and sheer exhaustion from inability to sleep. I stood, cradling my wounds against the obelisk, as Ambrose rose up and prepared to pounce again, when suddenly, something stopped him. He stood paused mid-lunge, his face frozen in what appeared to be utter shock, despite his oozing eyes. I stared at him for a moment, confused as to why he wouldn't attack, when I noticed that he wasn't looking at me anymore, but instead behind me toward the obelisk itself. His face was reflecting something, a bright light that made his already pale skin appear even lighter in color. When I turned then to look, I was immediately blinded by a light that seemed to burn even through my eyelids. It was as though the sun itself had exploded and that I had just attempted to look upon the supernova with the naked eye. It was a far more advanced feeling of the effect a total eclipse would have after attempting to look at it with the naked eye. This was more than just a light though. This was something sentient, something celestial, something alive. Even Ambrose, in spite of his possession, could see this too and was terrified of it. My eyes were searing inside my skull, slowly melting to slag. At any moment, I was afraid the rest of me would soon follow. Then, from the direction of the light, I heard the baritone voice I knew all too well. The inhuman boom of that tyrannical pharaoh. Away from him. The voice bellowed. Its tones echoed all throughout the space of the domed room. Slowly, I began to open my eyes once more. Once more, my eyes were strained in doing this, though I eventually succeeded in opening them all the way. My vision was blurred heavily, everything appearing to me as only a white, cloudy void with the vague outline of a person clad in a snow-white robe standing directly ahead of me in place of the obelisk. Distorted though my vision was, I noticed faintly that the being's limbs appeared to sway like branches in a strong wind and back and forth. I opened my mouth, but found myself unable to speak. I felt as though my throat had been muted, or that my voice had somehow been ripped from it. My mind was a firestorm of awe, fright, wonder, confusion, and more. So many thoughts, so many questions. So many feelings all at once invaded my mind, not allowing me a second to so much as breathe. Who or what was this thing? Where had it come from? The room? But then why had neither myself nor Ambrose seen it before? What was its purpose for being here now, saving my life like it had? Flesh must not continue. The end approaches and there will be no hiding from it. As you have deceived yourself in doing for so long now, flesh child. I noticed when he, it, spoke, that it was a sort of combination of the skinless humanoid's bestial growling and the hissing tone I heard before. I looked behind me toward Ambrose, either because of the force controlling him or because of something else entirely. He seemed unaffected by the heavenly light around the three of us. He stared forward and both terror and a sense of revulsion passed me toward the figure. You didn't believe you would prosper for the rest of time, did you? You weren't foolish to think that resetting this world would hide it from the gluttonous star. From chaos, did you? I watched Ambrose's mouth open, and from him the humanoid entity's own baritone voice bellowed. Flesh can live on. It will live on. You are our damnation. Just as you were then, so you are here and now. Looking back to the figure in white, I saw its arms raise, flailing jointless. I am not damnation, fleshling. I am truth. 
I am inevitability. Unlike my brethren, those you so cruelly slew, I am not here as an oracle. No, I am here as your harbinger of the end. I exchanged glances back and forth between Ambrose and the figure. Ambrose, I saw, began to clutch his temples and crumple to his knees, suffering some sort of migraine or pressure. <sighs> no! I heard Ambrose shout. No! I won't allow this! Flesh will continue! The flesh will live on through rebirth as it always has! Ambrose was in a fetal position on the ground now, clutching his temples now in nothing short of pure agony. What was going on with him, I could scarcely even guess. The figure replied, And when chaos finds you again, as I know he will, what will you do then? Rebirth will conceal you, but for only so long. You destroy and rebuild this pathetic, meaningless empire, this world, and you believe it will save you? You name me as damnation, yet I am only doing what is already predestined. Do you see? The figure began gliding forward, floating just above the ground as he did so. Out of reflex, I began moving backwards. Among all the spastic thoughts racing through my mind, the question then of what the figure might do to me once it reached me had my focus. In only 30 seconds, at least 10 or more possibilities inferring what godlike power this being had at its command flashed across my mind at once. I kept backpedaling until I inevitably came upon and tripped over Ambrose's writhing body. When I looked again, the figure had reached me, looming over the bodies of me and Ambrose on the ground. I tried to move away again, only to find myself against the wall. There was nowhere to run. I was done for. I closed my eyes then and began sputtering my last prayer hysterically. I stopped and opened my eyes, however, when I heard screaming of sheer agony coming from in front of me. I saw that the figure was leaning over the body of Ambrose, him having been its apparent target instead of me. The figure I saw had one tendril, yes, tendril, not a hand, around Ambrose's throat, and was glowing brighter and brighter. I could see the tendril searing the skin of Ambrose's throat, causing him to cry out that much louder. His screams weren't a man's screams, though, leastways not of any one single man. Rather, they were the screams of every living being on Earth, all at once from the throat of Lionel Ambrose. Still holding him down, the figure proclaimed, Yes, you see it now, flesh child. You see the folly in what you do. That is why I'm here, to put an end to all misery once and for all, exterminating flesh and spirit. In another instant, the figure burst into a ball of white light, and following another wail of pain from Ambrose, I heard it declare, Uralka, Ilik Adrakka, Chaos Ralik Gaon. Then the light dissipated, and the figure was gone. It was instantaneous, and at first I had no idea where I was, or if I had not perished in that burst of light. In another five seconds, however, I found that the room had returned to the way it had been before. Ambrose laid motionless on the floor in front of me. I turned his body over to find his eyes rolled back and glazed over. Pressing against his throat with my fingers, I found he had no pulse. Whatever had happened, whatever the figure, the white, faceless pharaoh had done to him, Lionel Ambrose was dead now. 
My attention was jerked away, however, when I heard the sound of stones shifting again. When I turned, I saw the obelisk was sinking, the ceiling following close behind it. Immediately, I was throwing my head around in a panic to find an exit of some sort. Everywhere I looked, though, I saw only the inscribed walls around me. I rushed to the nearest wall and began frantically prying at every divide in between the stones, praying one of them could be pried apart and that I'd find it in time. It only took me another 15 seconds of this to realize I wasn't going to make it out doing that. There was no escape. I'd avoided the death Ambrose received at the white pharaoh's hand, only to meet it at the hands of the obelisk itself. This was the price I would pay for the pursuit of knowledge, to witness a horrifying portent, and then to be buried with it forever, never to tell any others of it. I'd failed, not only as a journalist, not only to the world as the chronicler of the events that transpired in this godforsaken tomb, but to my purpose at coming in the first place, to tell the greatest story I'd ever know. To honor my fallen friend, Private Elroy. Then, amid the pandemonium, I faintly heard stones shifting again coming from the walls. Looking to my right, I found that a section of the wall was rising, revealing an exit to the room. Summoning every reserve of strength, I gunned it through the new doorway and into another dark corridor. There, I found that it too was shaken, with the ceiling lowering there and throughout as well. The tomb was collapsing, and I knew that it wouldn't be long before it would serve as the eternal resting place for any who were still inside when it did. Through the long, dark corridor I ran, I had no idea where I was going, and there was no way to know. A few times I'd slammed into a wall that I couldn't see, all around me, with each passing second, the walls and ceiling shook. The closer to the ground the ceiling came, the harder it soon became to even breathe. Still, I kept running. I wouldn't stop. I couldn't. Until either I made it out, or death took me. About three quarters through the latest corridor I'd found myself running through, I began to hear voices at my right, likewise clamoring in a panic like mice for the exit. For just the briefest of moments, I swore I could hear one of the distant voices cry out that they had found the entrance of the tunnel. Realizing there was still a chance to make it out alive, to tell this story and fulfill my promise, I turned and broke for the direction of the voices. Despite how much closer and closer they appeared, the further I went along, that last corridor stretched seemingly for an eternity. I was quickly running out of breath, out of strength, but I didn't stop. Finally, like I was looking through the abysmal tunnel of death itself and peering toward heaven, I saw the light at the far end. I could make it, and eventually, I did. In my hysteria when I found myself out of the tunnel, I was set to continue running, probably even to the ends of the earth, but was stopped by one of the men waiting on the outside in the campsite. It took another 10 seconds before they were able to get me to calm down and regain my composure. When I finally did, seeing that I was safe, that I had made it, and would live to tell the story after all, the only reaction I knew to have at that instant was to devolve into a sobbing, inconsolable mess. It was over. All over. I was alive, and now I had a story. When I could finally come back to myself fully, I took one last look toward the pyramid. It was gone, swallowed into the earth forever, or perhaps until the day comes that that nameless and horrifying white pharaoh chooses to re-emerge to preach once again of the end of days, as he had so long ago. To this day, I still wonder what he meant. I wonder of the things, too, such as whatever happened to poor Travis Buckner, or even to that rat bastard Benson. As for the ones that did make it out, of which only two of them were the Trinexus advisors, we were all exhausted and quite speechless from fright. 
Some from the handful of expedition crew survivors were even gibbering deliriously. Some even devolving into howls of mad hysterical laughter. I couldn't blame them. I can't blame them either for their fate afterwards, being confined to a mental institution. As I said, especially in writing this now, even long after, I wish now in a way that I could have been institutionalized with them. I wish that I could simply doubt my sanity during any of this and say that it never happened. Such is the paradox then. Before departing from the site, I requested that there be one last photo taken of those that survived that fateful and heroin experience. As damning as the memory is, the thought that I lived miraculously for over two weeks without food or water and through an unexplainable phenomena as what I had without fulfilling my promise to tell this story weighed far heavier on my soul. As I found out, I would make the right call in doing this. When I returned to the base in Saigon a few days ago, I planned to record this final part of this journey and send it for publication. Just yesterday morning, however, I received a brief letter from the Trinexus Corps, forbidding me from publishing or publicly speaking of any of the details I was aware of from the past month and that disobedience would result in criminal prosecution. I couldn't believe it, after everything I was forced to endure on their behalf, and after everyone else that lost their lives, they were now enforcing my silence. As much as I want to forget about this, I know I owe it to them and to Private Elroy to keep this chronicle, perhaps the only surviving record of their lives, and of the haunting truth with the act of discovery. They will not be forgotten even if only memorialized by these pages, never to see the public eye. To the men and women in the photo that day, November 11th, 1964, the day we narrowly escaped the hands of fate at the hands of that terrible white pharaoh's tomb, and to those that tragically never made it out, I say that, even if your country and the world has forgotten you, I haven't. I may not be able to tell your stories in my lifetime, but I know, as certain as I am that what happened in that tomb was real, that one day, someone will find these pages and will speak its story to the world. That is my cross to bear, to preserve the memory, both the honorable and the horrifying. Because of this, despite the still persistent, the only occasional night terrors I face, I can still find semblances of comfort. Because of this, I will still smile. The day of truth will come. I promise. That was the last entry of Paul Paul Dan's memoir. After that, up until the day he passed, he held on to this journal and its haunting tale. No matter how much it killed him to do so, he stuck to his word to communicate the events in Egypt. I've read this many, many times now since the day I found it in their old house. For the longest time, I had no idea of what to even make of it. My grandfather, granted, was never once in his career as a journalist reputed to be a slanderer or liar when it came to writing any columns, for and outside of the army. Still, for so long, I wasn't sure I could accept this as true. That is, not without some sort of concrete proof. I wanted to a degree, at least, to believe my grandfather. I wanted to believe that what he wrote in his memoir was real, and that my grandfather really was a hero, being the sole keeper of the memories of so many others. So I began looking for the truth. For at least the past ten years since Papa Dan passed away, I scoured across libraries, the internet, and even tried looking for old news articles to try and find anything. Anything from mid-November 1964 relating either to him, the Pyramid, or any of the other survivors. The only result from that, though, turned out to be a single article that more or less was summed up to say, Expedition crew mysteriously goes insane after stint in outskirts of Egypt. The article made neither mention of him or any of the others, 
The photo listed, however, surprisingly enough, was the same one Papa Dan had taken the day they left Egypt. Because of this, I knew something really had happened there in mid-November of 1964. It wasn't for another four years or so that I ended up finding out exactly what. Never giving up the pursuit to prove my grandfather's story to be true, I spent the next four years looking into and studying each Middle Eastern religious text I could find to see if there'd be anything relating to the white pharaoh, the pyramid itself, or any of the other beings spoken of in the memoir, while also saving money to book a flight to Egypt myself and see the site for myself. For the longest time until I finally managed to accrue the necessary funds, I was at a loss, being unable to find any sort of text relating to the aforementioned aspects in any known culture. It seemed then that the only way to prove his story was true was to ask the people of Egypt, judging from how afraid they were reported to be in Papa Dan's accounts. Finally, in the summer of 2018, I scrambled the money together and flew to Egypt to see the expedition site for myself. Like with my grandfather, I spent the first week in a small hotel that was both cheap and available while scouting the land. During this time, I tried asking a few of the locals what they knew of the white pharaoh of the desert pyramid, or of the obelisk itself. Most of them either looked at me confused or just kept walking, ignoring me. Some, though, older folks gave me the same grim, horrified expression Papa Dan described he had gotten when he asked. Just like with what he was told back then, I too was told that only infidels, fools, and traitors dared seek what I was after. Finally, I set for the site itself where my grandfather had narrowly escaped death all those years ago. This took another week, and when I did arrive, I was confused at first. There were no pyramids to speak of, at least not the one Papa Dan wrote of. It was when I came right on the spot that those few that had actually known of the pyramid had told me it'd be that I found it. Despite being buried under 56 or more years of sand, I saw what appeared to be a large slab of stone. Further investigation revealed the stone to be not of the pyramid itself, but a fragmented piece of that room. With the slab of stone bearing the eight-sided star hieroglyph Papa Dan described seeing upon the obelisk, the colossal terror that, according to his memoir, was capable of both the creation and utter devastation of all existence. The very thing that supposedly had been answering the white pharaoh's call. The most horrific aspect of all this, however, was that cradling the slab there buried in the sand was the skeleton of a man wearing the tattered remnants of the black polo trinexus uniform shirt. On the pocket, Though faded and worn, I faintly read the name, R. Benson, across the tag. It was true, all of it. The pyramid, the portents, the obelisk, all of it. It was real, and now I'd found it. Clutched by the bones of the very man that bestowed this journey, this curse upon him in the first place. How he managed to make it out, I don't know, and neither did Papa Dan or anyone else for that matter but all the same he did, commemorating his own memory of the expedition, of the day in which he and so many others paid the ultimate price for pursuing long-forgotten secrets. I suppose, though, I still have to commend him, because without him, there would have been no proof to corroborate my grandfather's greatest story, his most fantastic, most horrifying, and all-too-real account, The Obelisk. I say this now, if you can hear me, Papa Dan. Wherever you are now, this is for you. This is your day, the day you toiled so hard to make happen and for so long couldn't. This is the day of memory for you and for all the others, both that survived and those that didn't. For you, Papa Dan.
And that was The Obelisk by Arthur Corpse Child. A good reminder that some stories just beg to be told. Fucking Papa. A little about the author. Corpse Child is 21 years old with the fascination with the art of terror and the macabre. When he's not watching horror movies or reading horror novels or stories, he's always crafting his own chilling gospels of horror to terrify and eternally rob you of a peaceful slumber. Currently, he publishes most of his work to Reddit under his pen name, Corpse Child. Many of his horror stories have been featured and adapted to audio narrations by a wide variety of YouTube narrators, including some of the bigger names in the field, as well as the ones commissioned on the Chillin' app, and was featured in the debut issue of ill-advised records, The Dark Door Easing, and now is the in-house author, artist, and found a member for Psychotoxin Press, and its ongoing horror magazine, Identic Quarterly. And do old Drew Blood a favor, would you? Subscribe to his podcast wherever you do your listening and leave him a five-star review and a kind word, even if you're listening on YouTube. He needs soldiers on all fronts to win this battle, and he appreciates it. To hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all the other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click Patrons in the upper menu. You'll find yourself at ChillinTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to their entire audio archive, all ad-free and available to download or stream. Thank you for your time and for supporting our sponsors. When you support our sponsors, you support this show. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all the latest updates and new releases and have the chance to interact with them each and every week. Oh, and you can find Drew Blood on Facebook and Instagram, and sometimes Twitter. The Drew Blood's Dark Tales podcast is accepting submissions, friend. If you've got a story or two you'd like to be featured on the show, send it to drewbloodhorror at gmail.com. If selected, you'll get the full treatment, 10 bananas. Well, I'm afraid this is where we part ways, at least till next week. So grab a drink for the road, friend. You already made it this far. Might as well count on your luck to get home. I'd like to thank all the listeners this week for supporting the show and for all the kind comments y'all post on the Chillin' Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel. And I'd like to say hello to my big brother Chris. I haven't seen you in a while, brother. Miss you. Well, thanks for listening this week, y'all. May the wind be at your back, and may the road rise up to meet you. If you pass Safeway by any chance, tell Tim Finley to stop playing with monster trucks. But for now, let the mysteries be. If you can't, go fuck yourself. (laughs) Good night, y'all.
tales for dark nights.